Well, thank you so much again for the opportunity to preach. Uh, Before we even get started, though, uh, just like last week, I'm going to defer to Fred. Uh, Typically, he has the ability to sum up these nuggets of truth in about two and a half minutes. So we're going to hear what he has to say, and then I'll let you decide if you even want to hear me talk. So so, so we'll uh, we'll watch the video from Fred. Hello, Helltop. Taking the advice of our very own Bill Warmack, he says that if the church is not up on you, they're down on you. So I want to keep you updated here at Asbury Theological Seminary. This man right next to me is Ralph Waldo Beeson. He gave one of the largest gifts that have ever been given to an institute of higher education. He gave $60 million to this this seminary about 20 years ago. And that uh, that gift was given because Ralph was a lifetime Methodist, and he grew up in churches where they actually had boring preachers. Now, you've never experienced anything like that, but can you believe there actually are preachers out there who are boring? And so he, he gave this gift specifically that Asbury would cultivate effective, authentic, biblical preachers who are able to get at a person's heart. And so uh, uh, he knew that if churches have good preachers, uh, what often follows is growth. And if churches have growth, then those preachers have to also be good leaders. So part of what his gift goes towards is effective leadership and effective uh, preachers. There are preachers all around the world who have come uh, to the Beeson Center here to learn in this program. And the story has it that there's even one uh, man from Africa that when he got here, he knelt at Ralph Waldo's feet and, uh, uh, and honored him for his great gift. And then he rubbed his head. And then when he went back to Africa, story, the legend has it that he received a very sizable gift to his own local church. So you never know. But I wanted to talk to you about legacy when I'm thinking about Ralph Waldo Beeson's legacy. He gave so much, but there's another legacy that we can give. We can pass on our faith to one another. I'm reading in my daily devotions from 2 Timothy chapter 1. It says, I remember your genuine faith, Paul says this to Timothy, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now that same faith continues strong in you. There was a woman named Lois, and then her daughter Eunice, and then that faith was then passed on to their son Timothy. Do you know that we may not have all the resources in the world to give to an institution like Ralph Waldo Beeson did, but we do have the light of Christ that we can pass on. That can be our legacy to our own children, to our grandchildren, and to the people we encounter. I hope you'll think about how you can pass on that kind of eternal legacy. Good to see you. I'll talk to you next week. Oh, you cut out the best part. There's five seconds left, but that's okay. All right. So, anyways, you still want to hear me preach? Okay, okay, we're good. So, I'm just going to lay it all out there, guys, uh, everyone. Uh, I'll be real honest. I care more about this sermon than any that I've ever given. If, you know, God forbid I am to be smacked by a truck uh, on the drive home today, I hope that you remember what I have to say. And it's not just because I'm related to half of you who are in the audience today. (laughs) Um, But I really, truly consider all of you my brothers and sisters in Christ. And whether uh, you be an individual who I've known for years and years and we've been, we have a very close relationship, uh, or whether it, we're, we're still at that point where we're awkwardly trying to remember each other's first names as, as we wave uh, at each other in the hallway, I truly care about each and every one of you, and I feel so blessed to be a member of this faith community here at Hilltop. And so I just thank you again for the opportunity to preach while Fred is gone. Now, last week I came here with the introduction and I said, Hi, I'm Andrew Bittner, and I'm a sinner, I'm a fraud, and I'm a fake. Uh, Because what we talked about last week was living authentically for Christ. And how living authentically for Christ means to be truly identified with Jesus. You know, Paul says it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And we don't just want to be Andrew Bittner starring as himself in the drama of life. We almost want it to be as if it's Jesus Christ playing the role of Andrew Bittner or of Carmen or of Mark or of Kevin or whomever else. We want to be so consumed with Jesus Christ, so consumed with the Holy Spirit, that when people see us, they don't see us, but they see the love of Christ. And so last week, we answered two questions. And those two questions were, what does it mean to live authentically for Christ? And moreover, even if I know what it means, why should I care? Remember we said that living authentically for Christ, if you can pull that up, Jeff. I think it's the third slide. 
Living authentically for Christ is having our existence defined by Jesus, being one who is, uh, who is totally identified with Jesus. And we should care about living authentically for God because God, his essential nature, is love. And we are to resemble his perfect love back to him and all those we come in contact with. And so we must answer Christ's call to really do two things, love God and love people. And to be able to do that, we need to put to death and let go of those sins, let go of those idols that hold us back from him. So that we can finally, for once, not be those sometimes wishy-washy, maybe so, maybe not Christians, but people who are completely devoted to Christ without phoniness. So, you know, if you were here last week and you just got the Cliff Notes version, I know you're never going to forget what I just said, right? I mean, even if you weren't here last week, you've got all the key points right there. Just, just take a mental picture for a second. I know none of you will forget this, right? Uh, if you're anything like me, I think we're going to be in just a little bit of trouble. I can't even remember where I put my keys, so I'm not quite sure how it is that we're going to get back home. Um, but much less can I remember what was said two, three weeks ago. And eventually, these key points are going to fade. And if you're completely dependent upon a 20-minute speech each week, whether it be from me, whether it be from Fred, whether it be from any pastor, you know, you're in trouble because you're going to forget. And so, uh, even if you're even the most resolute individual, you will fall to the assaults of Satan. He wants to drag you down, and he will if that's all you have. It takes more than punching your card at church each week to sustain a holy, loving, devoted relationship with Christ. That brings us to this week's question. Where can I learn to live authentically for Christ? You know, for the other 99% of minutes that go on during the course of the week, besides that 20 minutes where you hear Fred or I speak, how do you sustain a relationship with Christ? And just like last week, I'm going to answer that question right away. I'm not going to make, make you wait 20 minutes to hear the answer because the answer is really simple. It's one word. It's Scripture. Where can I learn how to live authentically for Christ? It's Scripture. And like any sermon, we're going to dive right into Scripture itself. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5 through 5 and 10-17, through 17, Paul writes this, You must understand this, that in the last days, distressing times will come. Now when we see that phrase, last days, we think of this apocalyptic, you know, left-behind series, uh, end-of-the-world scenario. But John says somewhere else in Scripture that the last days are right now. The last days are any time since Jesus has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. So we are living in the last days now. So he's not talking about a future event. He's talking about today. He says, For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, Any parent who's in here knows that Paul is talking about right now, and this is not a future scenario. Ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderers, profligates, that's wasteful people, brutes and bullies, haters of good, treacherous, traitors, reckless, swollen with conceit, thinking only of themselves, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So kind of having that attitude, if it feels good, do it holding to the outward form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid them. So any any people who are just steeped in sin, and we know that we live in a broken and breaking world, and it's not only just those obvious sins that are easy to point out, but it's even those where uh, Paul says that there are those who will, uh, if you can go back just one slide, Jeff, that last line, it refers to those who are holding to the outward form of godliness, but denying its power. So there are those who even act religious and they'll put on a good facade. They're those legalists that we talked about last week, but their heart really isn't devoted to Christ. Now Paul talks about what will happen if you choose to follow Christ during this time of deep sin in this broken and breaking world. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and my sufferings, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. 
He's talking about events in the Acts of the Apostles where he's beaten repeatedly and brought to courts repeatedly before Jewish and Roman officials for preaching the gospel of Christ. He says, What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, listen, will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. Now, this seems like a pretty hopeless scenario. Not only do we live in a broken and breaking world who is turned against God, but if we decide to turn towards Christ and to advocate openly uh, for Christ and identify with Christ crucified, we will be persecuted. But there's hope. Paul writes to Timothy, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God. Another uh, phrase, that is, the way this is sometimes translated, it is breathed out by God. God speaks forth the words of Scripture. Scripture. And he says, All Scripture is useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient and equipped for every good work. So when Paul is saying uh, that Scripture is going to be kind of, Scripture is going to be our sword, Scripture is going to be the way that we stand up for Christ, the way that we uh, remain confident in our love of Jesus despite living in this broken and breaking world, he says, uh, scripture is really for four things, and those four things walk us through the whole walk of faith with Christ. It says that Scripture is for doctrine, and really what that means is Scripture shows us who God is, that God is a loving, merciful, holy God. Scripture is for reproof. It shows us that in light of God's holiness that we are sinful, but even though God's law, it breaks us, even though his word shows us that God is holy and we are not. God doesn't leave us to languish. God doesn't just leave us alone to suffer because he gives us correction in Scripture and shows us that the cross, that following Jesus is the only way to be saved from our sinfulness. And finally, he says that Scripture is for instruction into righteousness to conform us into the image of God so that we may be sanctified, so that we can more and more resemble the perfect love of Christ instead of our stained and sinful nature. And so all of this means that Scripture is ultimately given to equip us for every good work, to conform us more and more to the image of God, to show us how to live authentically for Christ and to be completely identified with Him. Now, some of you may say then, well, if the answer to where can I learn how to live authentically for Christ is Scripture, if that's the answer to the question, why, why Scripture? Why not other standards? Why not just my thoughts? Why not just my feelings? Why not scientific observation? Why not any other standard? Why Scripture? Well, let's go back to the waterfall model from last week. If we can go to the next slide. Perfect. If you'll remember, if you were here last week, we kind of used Niagara Falls as an analogy of who God is and who we are in relation to him. We know that God is a perfectly loving being, that, his Father, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are these three eternal, timeless, boundless persons living in this perfect, loving relationship in God. And that love is so abundant that it almost spills over. And in that spilling over, we were created. We were created when God said that I'm going to make them in my image. When he looked at his creation and said, it is good. He said that because he made us in his image to have his being, to be truly loving. And so the thing is, is everything that we have is completely dependent upon God. Our breath, our existence, each moment is dependent upon Christ. And so if everything that we have been given comes from God, the only way we can know anything about it is if God himself has taught us how to think about it and what it is. But what do we try to do? If you can go to the next slide, typically what we do looks something more like this. Now, I'll tell you right away that the name of this waterfall is called 
devil's kettle. So that'll just give you some idea as to how to think of this model. What we typically try to do is rather than thinking that we are fully dependent upon God for all that we have and all that we know, is typically what ends up happening is, you know, we kind of uh, elevate ourselves above God. You see, what happens with this specific waterfall, oh, can you go back? What, What ends up happening is that in this waterfall is that the river splits and it goes in two completely opposite directions and they never merge up again. And we try to explain our existence apart from God. We try to explain who we are apart from God. And God may be there, he's in the background, and we'll use him when he's useful, but we really never submit to him. We don't think of ourselves anymore as perfectly and intentionally designed to be the loving creations of God. We think of ourselves as independent, autonomous, free agents apart from God, able to think of what is right and what is wrong, what is truth and what is morality. And when we end up doing this, when we make ourselves the arbiters of truth instead of submitting to God's truth, ultimately what ends up happening is this. It's just me and my feelings. It's me and my thoughts. It's me and what I think. See, when we elevate ourselves above God, when we fail to submit to his word, it is no longer Uh, even possible to put together this cohesive view of even what a humanistic morality or a humanistic knowledge. There's no brotherhood of man. Really what it comes down to is it's me and my feelings. When When we do this, we fall into a cafeteria Christianity and we decide which commands or which verses of scripture we're going to adhere to and which verses we're not. And when that happens, there's no longer use for God at all I mean, there's no room for God in this picture because God will be subordinate to no one. God will be a pawn for no one. God is uncontainable, and God cannot be contained by our very own thoughts and feelings. And so anytime we get into this model and we descend to me and my feelings, what ends up happening is there's no Christianity anymore. It is, this is where we get, you know, sort of the garbage of, of new age spirituality where it's just, this is what feels good or this is what draws me closer to some sort of oneness or gives me some sort of spiritual enlightenment. But when we, when our thoughts and feelings become the foundation of truth, we're really just building a rotten foundation. And so that reminds us of Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. And Jesus said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and, in, and, and it fell, and great was its fall. You see that whether we are the wise builder who builds our lives upon the rock of Christ, upon his word, or whether we are the foolish builder who builds our life upon any other foolish system of our thoughts and feelings, or any other system, and build it on sand, the storms will come. The storms of life will come. Persecution, Paul says, will happen. And if our lives are not based, are not built upon the rock of Christ and his word, we will be washed away. What's worse is that many of us are completely ignorant of what God's word has to say. We haven't read it. And when we don't read scripture, what ends up happening, there's no way we're going to find the rock. You know, we're inevitably going to find sand, and inevitably our faith will be washed away. And so we must read Scripture. It is imperative. Now many of you may say to that, uh, Andrew, uh, newsflash, Scripture is boring. Uh, it's, it's not so applicable. You know, I don't really enjoy reading, script, <clears throat> excuse me, reading Scripture. One moment. I don't enjoy reading scripture. And, you know, I I experienced this firsthand. 
Uh, we're, we try uh, very hard to be consistent at our house about reading Scripture together as a family, about reading the Bible. And sometimes, even before I break it out, Johnny will sit down and say, I'm bored. And I feel incredibly convicted about this because, you know, Scripture is the story of how God has created the world, about how he sent his Son into the world to redeem it, to save us from our sins, how he rose from the dead, how he ascended into heaven, and how one day he is going to come back. It is the most beautiful, exciting story there is. It is the story of us. It is the story of God. But I think part of the reason that we think Scripture is boring is because we have a completely warped view of what Scripture actually is. A lot of us think of Scripture as being like a reference book. Stale, stagnant, inapplicable to my life, irrelevant. And we think almost as if it's an, a theological encyclopedia that God has penned out, bound up, and dropped out of heaven and some guy just happened to find it in a field. That it just sort of appeared. Uh, and if we have that view of Scripture, of course it's going to be stale. Of course it's going to seem irrelevant. And what's unfortunate is whether we're four years old like Johnny or whether we're 84, that's how most of us has, have typically come to know Scripture. And so we, this warped view of Scripture really sets up this wall that is completely unnecessary between us and God. Scripture is so much more than that. It is not merely molecules of ink bound to paper and bound up sitting on your bookshelf. Scripture is God's Word. And God's Word is dynamic. It's not stale. It's not stagnant. It's moving. It's vibrant. And it's alive. I think of all the biblical authors, John demonstrates this better than anyone. And so I'm going to go through three very short verses from John and what he has to say about the Word. And as I read these, I want you to listen very closely to how John uses the word, Word. He says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. He then writes later in that same book in chapter 5, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And then finally, and this is uh, pulled out, this is the same prayer that we did this morning at the beginning of the service in the call to worship. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. And so scripture, as God's word, is dynamic because Jesus Christ is God's word. We shouldn't think of scripture as merely being words on a page, but when we think of scripture, when we think of God's word, we should think of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not to say that you should pick up your Bible, set it on a stand, and kneel down to it and worship the pages of Scripture itself. But when we think of Scripture, don't think of it as merely words. Realize that it is the perfect, inerrant witness of who Jesus Christ is. It is the inerrant revelation of the true Word of God, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, and our Redeemer, and our King the one to whom we must submit. See, there's these beautiful parallelisms between God sending his word in his son, Jesus Christ, into the world with God sending his word in the words of Scripture into the world. God sent Jesus into the world so that through Jesus' teachings we may come to know the Father and that the Holy Spirit may come to live in us and we may enter into perfect, loving relationship with God. In the same way, God sent the teachings of Scripture into the world so that through reading them, we could come to know and love the Father and the Holy Spirit could come to live in us and we could enter into a perfect, loving relationship with God. And so, the re and so when we talk about Scripture, we can say that Scripture is incarnational. What that means is in the flesh. Remember John said that the Word became flesh. And so when we read the words of Scripture, it's not as though we're just reading a history book. We are making Christ present. We are making all of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, present. 
Now, knowing this should remind us of uh, probably the most, I think, terrifying and wonderful fact that there is. That God has spoken. If God has spoken, he has not, he's not merely some faraway designer God who made the earth and just kind of let it to run as it goes. He's not simply the projection of my imagination. I didn't mold God in my own image. If God has spoken, he is real. He has entered into this world. He has very clear things to say about who he is, who we are, and how we are to live. And that's why it's so important to believe all of Scripture. Because if Scripture is incarnational, if in reading Scripture God becomes truly present, that means that the events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are no longer just historical events that occurred 2,000 years ago. They are a living reality that we partake in right now. You know, very similar to the way when we take communion, we partake in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so when we read Scripture and we know that Christ becomes present among us, when we reject Scripture because it is the Word of God, we reject Christ. We reject Jesus, who is also the Word of God. We can't follow God without following His teaching. Loving God and obeying God are inextricably linked. You can't do one without the other. And God's teaching isn't just limited to those verses of New Testament that we like to hear, the ones like loving your neighbor as yourselves and forgiving your enemies. Those ones obviously are true. But we read things in the Old Testament, or we read things that Paul has to say, or we read the book of Revelation, and we we start to get squeamish, we start to get uncomfortable. And I'll admit that I am no exclusion. I read Scripture, I read some of the teachings of the Old Testament, and I have lots of questions. There's lots of why questions. So I'll, have, I'll question, for example, why did God choose Jacob and the Israelites to be his chosen people? Why did God send the Israelites to drive out and slaughter the Amalekites when they took over the land of Canaan? Why is it that Jesus Christ and his cross is the only way to heaven? Now, I don't know the answer to any of those why questions. I don't know the why. But I do know that God calls us to believe his word. God didn't say, well, suspend judgment or don't believe until you understand why you're supposed to believe these. As St. Augustine said, I believe so that I may understand. We need to have faith that if we believe God and believe the whole of his teachings, not just the nice fluffy parts, but the hard, uh, those sandpapery parts that... We trust that God will bring us understanding. And it may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, it may not happen in this lifetime. But at some point in our relationship with Christ, he will bring us to an understanding of why he has acted the way he has and why his teachings are the way way they are. We can't just, again, we just can't pick and choose what verses we like and which ones we don't. Because then we just get back to that circle, that big me circle. It's just me and my feelings. And we may trick ourselves and say, well, there's historical evidence that refutes this part, or we look at scientific observation and it refutes that part of Scripture. But what really ends up happening is you're just picking which verses you like. And you may find justification to pick one or the other, and you may trick yourself. What it really comes down to is you and your feelings. We must accept the Word of God in its entirety both as it is revealed in the word Jesus Christ and the word in Scripture. But here's the good thing. Here's the flip side to the coin. When we accept the whole teaching of Scripture, we don't have to be skeptical anymore. And yes, there are those hard teachings that we will have trouble understanding. But then there are those beautiful teachings, like Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, for your sins. He rose from the dead to conquer death for me and for you. He's going to come back and restore this earth for his children, each and every one of us. And because we don't doubt the parts that we don't like, we don't have to doubt the parts that we do like. We can have true faith in the full revelation of God, 
each verse, each word. And so this brings us to our assignment for this week. Your assignment is this. Meet God. Read Scripture. Begin learning how to live authentically for Christ. Now, I'm not asking you to pick up that 1,200-page book and read it in the next week or even in the next month or even in the next year. Start with a chapter a day. A chapter is not how we conceive of it in a chapter book as 20 pages. A chapter is like this much text. It will literally take you two minutes to read. You can just crack open your Bible and pick a page. Or if you don't know where to start and you want to do something more systematic, start with 1 John. We've had passages from it last week. We've had passages from it again today. But 1 John shows us who God is, perfectly loving. He shows us who he created us to be, to be good. And despite our sinfulness, what he has come back to do, and that is save us. So wherever you, but wherever you start in reading Scripture, remember this, you are meeting God. He is becoming present, whether you realize it or not. Scripture is our only source of truth. When you read it and Christ becomes present and his truth becomes alive in your heart, remember this. God has spoken. Amen.